It's a, a little unusual for me this evening because when Gerald asked if I would share something uh, on the second coming, I responded immediately and felt quite clear what I should be sharing with you. And then as the time has drawn closer, I've got less and less sure on what I should be sharing with you. And uh, I think something of the soberness that Gerald has picked up is there. I, I want to take up from the song that Dave and uh, Pat were singing about this new day that's dawning. And uh, I may not be saying what I was intending to say, but I want to share some scriptures with you and hope that out of these scriptures something of what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church will come through to our hearts. And I'd like to just begin with a question that is found in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 24. It's that discourse of the Lord known as the Olivet Discourse, but really it's the question on the hearts of the disciples that I want to underscore this evening, and you'll see it in verse 3 of Matthew 24. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? When will all these things be that you've spoken about? These things that you have prophesied? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end, the consummation of the age? After someone has settled the question of their relationship with God and their submission to the authority and the lordship of Jesus, after that question has been settled, perhaps the most compelling question that can come from our hearts is this one. When will all these things be fulfilled? What will be the sign of your coming and of the consummation of the age? You see, already the disciples had entered a little into the heart of Jesus. And they sent something of the burden that Jesus had begun to share, had begun to preach, had begun to enact through his acts and his miracles. But they knew that Jesus was not fulfilled. They knew that the heart of Jesus had not yet found a full expression. And they began to say to him, tell us more about the consummation. Tell us more about the end of the age. And Jesus spends the next time, it's taken up in chapter 24 and 25, trying to answer that question to their satisfaction. And then I noticed as I looked on to chapter 26, having spoken of the signs, he then goes on to say, after two days, the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be delivered up for crucifixion. And as if Jesus has gone on to the consummation and then suddenly gone back to the foundation of it all. And the foundation to all that is going to be consummated is there in that little phrase that they're going to take him and crucify him. And here is the foundation for all that Jesus is now doing in the church and all that Jesus is now doing in the world. And here in the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation for all that is one day going to be consummated in glory. And a number of times in this Olivet Discourse, Jesus speaks about his coming in glory. He speaks about the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the sky and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and with great glory. And again in chapter 25, he accents this emphasis that it's the glory of the Lord. The Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him. Then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. When will these things be? When will we see something of that consummation of all that Jesus travailed for in his death and his resurrection? 
This is the compelling question in the hearts of the disciples. They don't realize the significance of that question. They've hardly grasped the significance of his death. But we can look back in history and see that there is a cry there that is the cry of the church today. If you've answered the question of the authority and the lordship of Jesus, the question that should be burning in your heart tonight is, when will these things be fulfilled? When will be the consummation of the age? When will Jesus find his heart's cry totally satisfied? And all that travail that he began in his death and in his suffering and in his resurrection, all that travail will come to one mighty, glorious manifestation when the whole world will recognize that that travail was worth it. And the whole world will come to share in something of the heart concern of God to see a world redeemed and a world renewed. And they're asking this question. I hope you're asking this question. When will the consummation of the age come? And Jesus begins to answer. And I want just to draw attention to one or two verses. In verse 42 of Matthew 24, he says, Be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you be ready too. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Be ready, be alert, be watchful. Whenever I've spoken on the second coming... I have stressed one thing, and that is this, that when Jesus does come, it will not be an arbitrary decision that God has made in the heavens. It isn't that one day God wakes up and thinks, well, I've had enough of this scene. I better finalize it, and we'll send Jesus now. I wouldn't blame him for thinking that way, but I don't think he has thought that way. It isn't that God has a little time chart up in the heavenlies, and that's ticking away, and each day is being crossed off, and on this predetermined day, come what may, Jesus comes. Every time I've preached about the second coming, I've tried to hit that kind of concept, that kind of artificial concept about the return of Jesus as if it has no relevance with what's going on here below. Whereas in fact the scriptures show that the coming of Jesus is vitally linked to what is not only happening in the world in a general way but what is happening in the church in a particular way. And that it's what is going on in the hearts of God's people and what is going on in the lives of the church, it's that which is one of the determining factors in the return of Jesus. And I don't want you to see the return of Jesus as some far-off event that has no relevance to what you are here and now tonight. I want you to see that the return of Jesus is vitally relevant and linked specifically to the way we are living today. The scripture teaches that we can hasten the coming of the day of the Lord in 2 Peter. And I'm sure the opposite applies. We can postpone things. And whereas God reserves the sovereignty of it all to himself, I wanted to emphasize a little tonight that he has put a responsibility and a burden on the people of God to be watchful, to be alert and to be ready. And that word ready is so significant because it's the word that characterizes the ministry of John the Baptist. It's the same word he uses, prepare. Be ready, be prepared. And John the Baptist was sent as the one to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus. He had to bring those mountains down. He had to raise the valleys. He had to prepare a highway for his Lord. 
And right from the day of his birth, that was the commission that Jesus had given to him. Prepare the way for me to come. I want you to see the tremendous responsibility and the tremendous commission that John the Baptist had. A new day is dawning, and a new day was dawning because John the Baptist had responded to the commission of his Lord and prepared the way for him. And because a simple, insignificant man had responded to the Lord's commission, God was manifest in the flesh. Because there was a man who took the anointing of the Spirit of God and worked out the heart and the purpose of God, Jesus was able to move into this world with supreme majesty and power and authority and demonstrate the redemption of his God. But it needed that preparation. It needed a man with a heart ready, a man who was in tune with God, a man who was sensitive with what God was after at that time in the world's history. And it's that same word that is taken up here concerning the consummation of the age. Be prepared. Be alert. Make preparations. Be adjusted for the return of Jesus. And then the other word that's used there, be watchful and alert. That's also used in the gospel. And Jesus takes that up in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he says, watch and pray. How can we be prepared for the return of Jesus? Well, I want to just follow up one theme with you tonight, and one only, by prayer. Watch and pray. Be prepared, be watchful, be alert. And then Jesus links that word with watch and pray. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was preparing himself for his death. And he called his disciples and said, Watch and pray. Enter into the preparation with me. Just think of that. The cross was something that Jesus had to go through alone, but he wanted his disciples to watch with him and to pray with him and to prepare him for that death. And he came back and he found them sleeping. They did not respond to the commission, to the call of the heart of Jesus to pray. The enormous thing, I mean, this is one of the most pathetic stories in the gospel, that the Son of God should say to human beings, will you watch and help me prepare for this death? That he should want people to share that with him, should honor them with that. And all they found time for was sleep. And Jesus had to go through that preparation on his own. And the disciples missed out on one of the highlights of their lives. I think it's such a touching story, that Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus called for someone to stand with him and help him prepare the way for death. They weren't there. Now let me take that on to the second coming of Jesus. Just as God called John the Baptist to prepare the way for his first coming, just as he'd wanted people to help him prepare the way for his death. So Jesus has called for a people who will prepare the way for his second coming in power and glory. And unlike his death, which only he could suffer and could only take on his own shoulders, he has committed the outworking of his return in glory to the church. It's not only that he calls us to prepare for his second coming, but he calls us to share in his second coming. We couldn't share in the end product of his first coming because that death and that resurrection was the prerogative of Jesus and Jesus alone. But out of that death and resurrection, he has given birth to sons in his own image. And he tells us that one day he is going to manifest those sons in glory. And he says that when he comes, we shall be like him. It's not only that he's saying, will you prepare the way for my return, but you're going to share in that return. 
and down through the generations, the heart of God has been for this prepared people that he can return to and manifest the glory of his sons. Watch, be prepared by prayer. And when we miss out in this realm of prayer, we are missing out in one of the very vital parts of preparing a people for Christ's return. The power of prayer is beyond our understanding. Jesus in this very discourse says, pray that your flight be not in winter or on a Sabbath day. You see, the praying can take care of the details. Praying can affect the whole outworking of the purposes of God. And he says to his disciples, you pray that it's not going to be on a Sabbath day. You pray that it's not going to be in the winter. You pray about these details because although I'm going to work out my purposes on the earth, they're going to be worked out through your prayers. I want you to catch the burden of this. He hasn't said these days are going to happen. doesn't matter what you do about it. doesn't matter what you think about it. It's going to just take place. He says these things are going to happen and I want you to share in it. I want you to take part in it. I want you to pray about some of the details of this fulfilling of my heart's purposes. Can you accept that tonight? He wants you to pray about his return. He wants you to be concerned about the detailed outworking of his return. It's not some far off event that has nothing to do with us. It's an event that God wants to put into our hearts as a burden for prayer. God one day looked down at Sodom and Gomorrah and he had his mind fulfilled as regards his purposes. But he said, well, can I, can I not share what I'm going to do with Abraham seeing he's going to come into an inheritance? And he calls Abraham in and shares his purpose with Abraham. And Abraham begins to take some initiative in those purposes of God and says, well, why are you going to destroy this city? How about if you found 50 people there? Would you avert that judgment? Yes, I'd avert that judgment, says God. Can you see now this detailed praying? God has revealed his purposes, but Abraham takes hold of those purposes. What if there's 45? Well, yeah, I'll still avert the judgment. What if there's 40? Yeah, I'll still avert that judgment. And here's Abraham praying about the details. Praying about the detailed outworking of the will of God. And finally comes down to ten. Yes, for the sake of ten I would save that city. And in the end there wasn't ten to be found, but Lot was saved. And one of the burdens that God will put into our hearts is the cry for the salvation of souls. God is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness. But he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And one of the reasons for any delay in the return of Jesus is that there might be the work of salvation going on in the hearts of the people that you love and care for. And one of the burdens that we can start praying for is that God's judgment will be averted in order that salvation may come. We are living in tremendously exciting days. You've heard what's happening in Korea. You've heard what's happening in South America. You've heard what's happening in South Africa. There are people being saved by the, I can say, the million. We are seeing unprecedented movements of mass conversion that we have not seen in church history before. It's not just as a charismatic move. There is now a tremendous move of salvation afoot around the earth. And we need to be alive to that and alert to that. If God is saving souls, it's because he wants to avert judgment. And it's a sure sign when I'm seeing all this kind of salvation that's taking place around the world that times are coming closer. And we need to be moving in on praying for the salvation of men and women. And then I think of the example of Daniel on prayer. Remember how in Daniel 9 he reads about Jeremiah's prophecy, about the restoration of the captivity after 70 years. Now here's a specific promise of God. After 70 years I will restore the captivity. I will bring my people back from Babylon and restore them to the land of their inheritance. 
Now, many of us would have looked at that promise and we would have said, well, that's great. God has said he's going to do it after 70 years so we can sit back and put our feet up and enjoy the fire. But the first thing that, Jer that Daniel did was to go down on his knees and confess his sins and the sins of his people. And one of the most tremendous prayers in the Bible is recorded in Daniel chapter 9. He didn't take the will of God for granted. He didn't think that the will of God would be outworked irrespective of the condition of the people of God. And so he prepared his heart and the hearts of the people around him for the return from Babylon. And God found a man in Abraham. And God found a man in Daniel. And God found a man in John the Baptist. Will God find a generation in us? The scriptures I want to leave with you are found in two places in the New Testament, three places. The first one is that of what we term the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, your kingdom come. We say it so often, but we miss the significance of it. Our Father, you who are in heaven, your name is holy. And as if you can't get too quick past that introduction, your kingdom come. That's the prayer that Jesus committed to his church, to his disciples. Pray for the kingdom to come. Now, in one sense, the kingdom had already come in Jesus himself. Our Father, you who are in heaven, your name is holy. And as if you can't get too quick past that introduction, your kingdom come. That's the prayer that Jesus committed to his church, to his disciples. Pray for the kingdom to come. Now, in one sense, the kingdom had already come in Jesus himself. The power of that kingdom was demonstrated when Jesus walked the earth, healed the sick, worked miracles, preached the gospel of good news. That was a demonstration of the kingdom, the authority of God amongst men. In one sense, the kingdom was there in Jesus, but he said to his disciples, you pray for the kingdom to come. In other words, the kingdom manifested in Jesus was not the ultimate expression of the kingdom of God. And for that ultimate expression, it requires the prayers of the people of God. How should we pray? Well, this is how you should pray. Our Father who is in heaven, your name is holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if prayer means anything, it means that without that prayer, something isn't happening. If prayer does take care of details and we're not praying, something isn't happening. And Jesus said, I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to pray this prayer with all your heart, not a pallet repetition, but Lord, your kingdom come. I think Jesus wants our hearts to be consumed with that prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. But we're so concerned about our problems, we're so concerned about our day-to-day -day living, we're so concerned about the next two or three years that we do not get a real burden in our hearts, born of the Spirit of God, to pray consistently for the return of Jesus. The second passage is in Corinthians. Just a simple word, Maranatha. Our Lord, come. Jesus gave that prayer to the church, and then in Corinth we see Paul echoing that prayer. Our Lord, come. We know from the Didache and some of the early church writings that that prayer was linked particularly with the communion. So that as they broke bread together as they shared a meal together their response was Maranatha Lord come come now and presence yourself with your people presence yourself if you like with these elements of your body and your blood but more than that 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 feast that love feast was done in remembrance until he come 
And the cry of their hearts was Maranatha, our Lord, come. Not just here and now as we celebrate your death and your resurrection, but Lord, come in all your fullness, come in all your glory, come and consummate your purposes amongst men. Maranatha. And then the final passages of Scripture are found in the book of Revelation. And I'm going to read these to you. The first one is in chapter 1. And we find it in verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, even so. Amen. Now that's the response. Behold, he is coming. Even so, amen. And as John was taken in vision to this day of consummation, and this scripture was coming clear to him, behold, he is coming, his heart's response was, even so, amen. And that's the response that Jesus is wanting to put in our hearts. That's the compelling question, and that's the compelling prayer for the people of God. I want you to move on to chapter 5. And this is a tremendous chapter because we find Jesus taking the book, the sealed book, sealed with seven seals that no man could open. And Jesus takes hold of this book and he begins to open the seals. And if you look just quickly through uh, chapters 5 and 6, you'll find that as the seals are opened, events take place on the earth. So here is Jesus, the risen Lord, taking the seal book that no one else was able to open. And as the seals are opened, so events take place on earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is demonstrating his sovereignty by opening the seals and events are being released down here below. But I want you to note that before the first seal is opened, we have this picture. And we've got it in verse 8 of chapter 5. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And then in chapter 6, the seals are opened. And so we see Jesus on that throne with the book that only he can open. But before anything happens, there is the ascension of the prayers of the people of God and the praise of the heavenly courts. And then the seals are opened. And it is the praying of God's people that triggers the opening of the sealed book. Let's move on from the seals to the trumpets in chapter 6. Well, before that, chapter 6, verse 9, when he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers who were to be killed even as they had been should be completed also. So even here, those who are at rest, those who have been martyred, still have that burden for the consummation, still have that burden to see the purposes of God fulfilled. Move on to chapter 8. And under the seventh seal, we see seven angels, in verse 2, with seven trumpets. And again, as those trumpets sound, so the judgments of God go forth through all the parts of the earth. So the seals release the trumpets. And the seventh seal, we see the angels ready to trumpet forth the final warnings of God to humanity that consummation is at hand. 
But again, notice this, before the first trump sounds, in verse 3, another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hands. Verse 6, the seven angels prepared themselves to sound. It's prayer that triggers off the trumpets. In just the way that before that seal was opened, the prayers of God's people ascended. They were cooperating. They were sharing. They were identifying in the purposes of God. And something began to happen on earth. And likewise, as this seventh seal opened, and just before those trumpets sounded, the saints of God, their prayers ascended again. And there was a triggering off of the trumpet calls. Move on to chapter 12. And the trumpets have sounded. The seventh trump sounded as it recorded in chapter 11 and verse 15. So the trumps have sounded. There's only one thing more to come, the vials of wrath. And in chapter 12, before that happens, we see the woman giving birth, traveling in birth for a man-child. Verse 4 and 5. And she gave birth to a son, a male who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And then the devil was cast out of heaven, knowing his time was short. And his final expression on earth in the Antichrist begins. And then, at the end of chapter 13, you see the manifestation of the beast and the false prophet. In the end of chapter 14, you see the harvest. All right? Now this birth, this woman giving birth and travailing for the man-child, that man-child is not Jesus. That's an event of the past. Jesus is already there in his resurrection glory, as we've seen there in chapter 5. We're not going back now. We're going on into the revelation of the future. And we're seeing the church travailing to bring forth the man-child who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. If you look at the overcomers in Revelation, you'll find they're characterized as ruling with a rod of iron. And finally, the church has travailed to bring to birth a people who can share the rule and the authority of their risen Lord, who can move in power and authority with him in prayer, who can oust Satan from his heavenly places, who can oust the hordes of demon spirits, and who can trigger off the final expression, not only of evil on earth, but trigger off the final expression of the authority of the church of Jesus. And so before anything happens, whether it's seals, trumpets, or the vials of wrath and the judgments of God, we find that Jesus has a people in that book of Revelation who have shared his purposes, shared his heart, and prayed them out here on earth, prayed out the details, prayed out the effectiveness of the heart of God to his people. And then if you move to the final chapter of Revelation, chapter 22, and verse 17, you'll find the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. In verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come. Lord Jesus. And so if chapter 1 begins with a response, even so, amen, so the last chapter closes with that same response. Even so, come quickly, Lord, the Spirit and the Bride uniting to say, come. We know what the will of God is. It's to bring his heart's purposes to fulfillment to bring the people of God into their full inheritance. What happened in, in the captivity of Babylon and the restoration is just a, a miniature picture of what Jesus wants to do for his people today, to bring them out of all their bondages and all their captivities and release them into the freedom of sons of God. And this is a prayer burden. We see it in Romans chapter 8 that the whole of creation is groaning and travailing for the manifestation of the sons of God. And it goes straight in. This, we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit knows how to pray and intercedes for us after the heart of God. 
And in Romans 8, the whole of that prayer burden is linked with the manifesting of the sons of God. And that's the travail he wants to bring upon us. Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 5, we groan to be clothed upon with resurrection bodies. And it's the same echo of Romans 8. There's a groaning and a travailing. There's a praying, Lord, consummate your purposes. Bring your people into resurrection life. Manifest something of the glory of your resurrection in your people. And I hope I've demonstrated through these scriptures that that's got something to do with you. And that's got something to do with me. And that's got something to do with us tonight. And Jesus' heart is longing for a people who will share his burden to consummate his purposes, who will help prepare the way for his return. And we could look at many things, like godliness and holiness and preaching. But the one thing I want to leave with you is this prayer. Your kingdom come. Maranatha, the spirit and the bride uniting in one wholesome travail to bring Jesus back. The spirit and the bride uniting in one generation to finalize all the purposes of God. I'd like us to get into some prayer tonight. Gerald has triggered us off on two or three occasions in prayer. But I'd like to feel a sense of some corporate praying tonight. That the Spirit and the Bride together will take up the cry, Our Father, you who are in heaven, you whose name is holy, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, that you forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Because we know your kingdom can't come until our lives are ready and prepared. And the same message that John the Baptist brought to prepare the people was one of repentance. And the same message that Daniel prayed in chapter 9 was one of repentance, confessing his sins. And the same message we see here is that Jesus wants us to prepare our hearts. A bride who has made herself ready, has holy garments, spotless garments, to welcome the King. Can we stand, please? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your promises are so clear. And your promises will not be frustrated or thwarted because ultimately your word and your Holy Spirit will produce a generation that will cry out with the depth of their being, our Lord, come. And we will find that heaven and earth agree. And the sovereignty.